Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Bill Phillips with the Prince George Daily News here with Tracy Caligeros for our regular uh, Talk BG panel, uh, our weekly panel, which uh, has been diminished down to two these days. So, <laughs> so I don't know if we qualify kind of, as a okay. panel. This sounds yeah, like Yeah, I don't know if we qualify. So it's going to be a conversation. Well, well, this can kind of be an interview since uh, Tracy put herself in the hot seat earlier this week, uh, uh, writing, writing an, an op-ed about uh, um, Elections Canada de decision to rent uh, space from the diocese uh, here in Prince George um, for the election and uh, how that was uh, uh, insensitive to a lot of Indigenous voters. So Tracy, over, over to you. Tell us, tell us, sort of recap a little bit uh, about uh, what you what you had written about and uh, and the reaction you've received so far. Well, I'd, I'd start by arguing that Elections Canada put themselves in the hot seat as opposed to me putting myself in the hot seat. Um, you know, it's interesting to me to watch how this has unfolded. Uh, the Prince George Diocese has been rented as the primary main office for the Caribou Prince George election campaign for Elections Canada. And I knew that because when I signed the contract for the exploration place to also be a polling station, I had to return it to the diocese. It bothered me then because quite frankly, I don't want my tax dollars going to the diocese. However, I thought, well, okay, fine. I know it's sh everyone's short of space. It's only the election headquarters. It's not like the public has to go there. Well, then I started to realize watching folks coming into the exploration place polling station and being sent up to the diocese to vote that in fact, the diocese is also a polling station. And once we investigated that a little bit, it became clear that it is a polling station for tens of thousands of people in Prince George from somewhere around the Westwood pub all the way up and past the Bon Voyage. It's replacing two schools that were not available to them this time around. So I get it, they needed lots of space. But the fact of the matter is that the Prince George Diocese is hardly the organization that you want to be sending anyone to, let alone Indigenous voters. And so um, it became an issue for me. I got really upset about it. I got angry and reached out uh, complaint with a complaint. And the folks I was talking to as well here at the, the polling station, and I could see it. My anger was being met with dumbfounded, growing realization of why I was angry and what I was saying and the, the validity of what I was saying. And it became clear to me that no one had even considered the idea that it could be uncomfortable or inappropriate to ask any voters, let alone Indigenous ones, to attend at the diocese in order to be able to cast their ballot in this federal election. So I recognized my own part in the problem and I have tried with the op-ed that I sent to backpedal my anger and start to talk about this as probably the best example of systemic racism that I've ever seen for a teaching opportunity. You know, it's, um, it's so crystal clear that by disenfranchising the Indigenous vote, you are keeping them out of all of the decision making, even so far as to disenfranchise their vote altogether. So, you know, I, I think it needs to be looked at as a teaching moment and a teaching opportunity. And, and the response I'm getting has not been negative. I, I, I realize like you opened by saying I'd put myself into the hot seat. Well, I, I did expect there to be some negative backlash and there's been very little. For the most part, people have recognized that church and state are meant to be separate and that we should not be voting in churches and that we should certainly not be sending tens of thousands of people to the Prince George Diocese at this moment in time as we continue to unearth children's bodies in unmarked graves in churchyards all across this country. And so to combine once again, the federal government and the church at the moment of an election is just the most spectacular example of systemic racism that I can think of to try and use as an educational tool for the dominant society. Um, yeah, I, I agree that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously a, a tone deaf move, but, but on the other hand, it's like, and you mentioned, um, in this election, Elections Canada is not allowed to use any schools, so they're probably scrambling for space. Um, I don't you know, doubt so, that, but being inconvenienced is not something that it gives you a right to then do something that is not just an inconvenience, but a, an affront and an insult to huge groups of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, I agree. But it, it's, it's. I, I guess the other part is, is, is how far does this go? Is this, is this, uh, you know, we talk about cancel culture and, and sort of what we're suggesting. 
is uh, should we be canceling the Catholic Church? I'm not asking to cancel the Catholic Church. I'm asking for it to be separate from our federal elections or any elections. You know, there's mm -hmm. scientific studies that have been on the books for decades that say that people vote differently when they are in a church, when God is watching. Uh, so I, I would say that if we're talking about free and fair and unfettered elections, then put, sending people into any kind of a religious situation is inappropriate. Uh, there's lots of people that have trouble with all different kinds of churches, not just the Roman Catholic. And if you want to talk cancel culture, I think the Roman Catholic Church and the Canadian government originated that with their residential schools and trying to take the Indian out of the child. That's like the ultimate in cancel culture. So sorry for yeah. buying that argument. Yeah, no, it, that, that's that's certainly true. Uh, um, well, maybe not cancel culture, but uh, you know, should we be boycotting the Catholic Church for these kind of things? Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm just sort of questioning how far these kind of things can go. Well, I think that people have to start thinking about all religious organizations as private clubs. You know, I'm not religious. I don't participate in any level of church, and I don't take that away from anyone else's right to do so. But I don't think that the general population should be paying to support any of those private clubs, nor do I think they should be tax exempt. And I, I really do believe that the, the churches need to deal with the, the, the colonial, the dominant approach they have taken uh, in history. It's not right. It's not acceptable in today's society. And if folks want to have a religious activity within a church, I, I don't have a problem with that. Then they should do it themselves and pay for it themselves and stay within their organizational situation and, and do the things they want to do to contribute to society as a member of that private club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm with you with the separation of church and state, and, and uh, uh, sadly, we we see it uh, going the other way too often. Uh, uh, we have a lot of politicians who who like to wrap them wrap themselves in the flag and the church, uh, and uh, that's and we see where how dangerous that is, right? So, yeah, I, I don't I don't have any. When I talk about canceling the Catholic Church, I, you know, I don't have any problem with doing that. <laughs> Just you know, one of the one of the comments on that article was that everybody who is going to have to go into that diocese to vote should be wearing an orange shirt for every child matters and stopping long enough at the diocese office to ask to have the Pope make a formal apology, as has been requested by Chief Logan and many other chiefs across this country. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. understand why they are exempt from civil society and common decency. I really don't. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also one of the ones that uh, I've argued for years that uh, tax exemptions for churches is, is a bizarre idea that was probably created centuries ago, uh, and, uh, and we still hang on to it. And uh, there's a great hue and cry every time somebody mentions that, oh, maybe we should start taxing the churches. Well, yeah, why not? Uh, I, 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 I simply don't understand uh, uh, that part of our society other than it's historic and, and and just because it's historic as we've learned with the uh, residential schools and all the other things that are historic in our society just because they're old and traditional doesn't mean that they're right in fact and that's old another and traditional one. is kind of not where we're headed as we move into the future yeah exactly you know when yeah. you look at it through history and you look at the relationship and the ties between church and state it's really about consolidating power and control and I think that there's lots of good in all religions out there there's plenty of wonderful advice and teachings and counsel to support thy neighbor and all of the rest of it the fact of the matter is human nature gets in the way in practice and when you combine it or marry it to politics it is one of the most destructive partnerships on the planet not just I'm not specifically picking on the Catholic Church here I'm talking about religion right across the board if you marry yeah. religion with state, you are inviting a very dangerous combination of the consolidation of power and control through fear of what happens to you in the afterlife. And I just cannot, I cannot abide by it. And it has resulted in the deaths of millions upon millions of people through history. And most, most spectacularly in recent years, when you look at the residential schools here in Canada and what that has done to the Indigenous population, not just to the individuals it directly impacted at the time, but the generations since and the generations to come. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, it's just been, uh, it, it, we, we just passed the 50 year anniversary of Imagine, you know, Imagine No Religions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you can look through history and, and, and look at uh, the main cause of human strife and destruction and death over its history and it's been religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you know, I think even though every every religion in the world, like you say, they do they do good, and every religion in the world has has the same premise about peace on earth and goodwill to fellow man and and all that kind of stuff. And yet here we go. Uh, you know, we only need to look at uh, at uh, you know a place like Afghanistan with the Taliban and and their interpretation of 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 Islam is just crazy in, in my mind in a lot of people's minds and yet and, and they have no no problem going out and killing people because uh, their their religious doctrine tells them to and and i think that that's just wrong and it's one of the things that we as a society throughout the world have to get over uh to progress you know yeah i but, suspect uh, that there will always be a role for religion for various people in various societies even into the future and regardless of what's happening right now as we work through this wrenching change but i think that religion, not like my own industry of museums, which is rooted in a colonial past and inception. And so if you have the same groups in the religious world that are even more entrenched and centuries older than museums, it's tough enough to try and shift the culture within museums that are still governed largely by old white men with British accents. The, mm -hmm. the religious side of that is so much more profound because children are brought into religions by their parents very young and they grow up within a religion and so that doctrine is part of their person it's part of their soul and part of who they are and so to ask them to step aside from that or to change it or to challenge it as an adult is even more difficult and i i just really believe that we're working through this moment of change in humanity that future historians are going to look back on and wonder how we all managed to muddle through. But a big piece of that change also has to happen within all religious orders. And having the Prince George Diocese at this moment in time as the only option to vote in this election that is supposed to be about reconciliation and about bringing Canadians together isn't just tone deaf, it's wrong. And I don't think there was any intent on anyone's part, but the fact of the matter is those contracts, those addresses, those signs and shipping, people all the way up the chain, all the way to the headquarters of Elections Canada in Ottawa, sent things to the Prince George Diocese, and it never crossed anyone's mind. And that has to be because there is not a single Indigenous person in the decision-making structure of Elections Canada that would have seen this because I haven't spoken to a single Indigenous person that didn't immediately react the way I did. Mm -hmm. It's systemic yeah. racism in action and uh, unintentional or not, it has a massively chilling effect on people's willingness to participate in society and in their willingness to believe that non-Indigenous Canada actually cares or gives a shit about where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, Staying on the right race, this topic, but switching uh, switching a little bit. Uh, the big news in in Prince George this this week is the resignation of Trent Derrick and uh, and oh geez, I can't Sharice uh, Val Mohammed uh, as board chair and, and vice chair of the school district uh, board of education uh, after the you know damning report about uh, uh, systemic racism in the school district. So so what's your what's your take on on that uh, in in where the, what the district has to do and, and and where this is all going to shake out? Well, the report was damning. Um, it was absolutely scathing, and I think it was bang on the money. Anyone that watched what happened with the Shasti naming uh, can't believe that there isn't systemic racism and overt racism within the school district. You know, I, I feel for Trent and Sharosa. I, I don't. Um, I didn't know anything about the resignations prior. It hit the news. I read it like everybody else, and I think that the school district needs to really face facts. And my biggest concern right now is who's going to run for those two seats in the by-elections. Because if uh, people that are in the BIPOC community have completely disengaged and thrown up their hands, what voices are going to be at that table to do that work and to fix what needs to be fixed? And you know, it, it's part of why I wrote 
the article that I wrote because the emotional labor of educating non-Indigenous Canada to the impacts of systemic racism and, and what it even is should not continue to fall on those people that are being oppressed and discriminated against. And I suspect, although I haven't spoken to Trent, that he's exhausted, that he's, mm -hmm. he's disillusioned, that he's frustrated, that he's exhausted, and that he just can't continue to carry that load on his own. So I'm, I'm most concerned about which school district trustees next step up. And I'm very concerned that the problems that they've identified at the senior level, both on the board and in staff, are not going to be easy ones to tackle without probably bringing in outside folks that will have the hammer and the control to be able to insist on change. Well, you're, you're right. It'd be, there's going to be a by-election within probably three months. So uh, it will be very interesting. And, and I certainly hope that uh, uh, Clayton Lake Tanay and or the McLeod Lake Indian Band uh, put forward some candidates because they've been wanting to get on the board uh, you know, they want to be, have a, a, just have a, you know, a standing seat on the board. Well, here's an opportunity to get in there before, um, before the ministry makes a decision one way or the other to, to designate those seats on the board, whether they do or not, here's an opportunity. So I, I hope they get involved in, in, in running campaigns. Um, uh, McLeod Lake's probably close enough to McKenzie to run a candidate from there, uh, in the, in the McKenzie riding. Um, you know, so, you know, Get involved, and I hope other people get involved too. Uh, there, there is some irony here, though, and and uh, you know, you, you mentioned the the Shasti Kelly Road uh, renaming. It was they've named uh, uh, Sherelle Warrington as the board chair in the interim, I guess, and uh, uh, and I could see that she's you know she's been there. She knows she knows how to be a board chair. She knows she knows what to do. She can she can run the board. There's no problem. And, 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 and all that kind of thing. But the irony is, is that she is the one at the board table that tabled the motion to keep the name of Kelly Road as Kelly Road. And she dismissed the idea of there being systemic racism in the school board or the school district. Um, so it is an irony is that not, that's now who's chair, uh, not, to, not to take anything away from Sherelle. She's got a you know, vast experience, but it, to me, it's just, it, it's, it's, it is a bit of an irony. I, I kind of wish somebody, uh, you know, they would have picked somebody else to to sit in uh, that I, position. I don't see that that's ironic. I think that that's depressing. And I think it's also really a clear example of exactly what Trent's resignation letter talked about when he said that Robert's rules and some of the other formal uh, structures that we operate businesses within are non-Indigenous society are actually standing in the way of making the kinds of change that needs to happen. I mean, if the ministry is smart, they will appoint uh, or they will pro provide those two seats as appointments for the McLeod Lake and Klitwitzne nations and um, try and move forward from there. But I, I think that there's more significant structural change that needs to happen. And given that the chair sets the agenda and the chair sets the tone to have gone from these resignations to a chair who has already publicly gone on the record as saying that they don't believe that systemic racism exists and therefore will discount this entire scathing report, I think is a huge mistake. And it's also a horrific message to the individuals that that report was written to try and protect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to Trent Derrick oh, last time I talked to him was probably a couple of months ago now. Um, I haven't talked to him since he resigned. Um, but I know back then he was very frustrated. You know, he, he mentioned to, to me about being frustrated because he's bringing issues up at the board and basically um, being dismissed by my board and uh, uh, by other board members and, um, and staff, you know, like it's just, and, it, and it's tough to be in that situation. And I know there's been a few comments. So like, this is the board and the, the vice chair, the chair and the vice chair, why can't they just fix things? Um, but it's, it's a lot, more complicated than that, you know. I, I've often uh, talked to city councilors and that, and they have the best ideas in the world, but they don't have to. They, the job isn't to convince the community that something is good. The job is to convince three or four other people around that table that it's good. And yeah, they're only you, one vote. Effective, right? And I know that Trent has been enduring a lot of harassment at his business, and his staff have had to deal with that, and his family ever yeah. since the JST discussion started. And, you know, I, I think that people don't recognize the level of abuse that elected officials take, primarily people of color and women. 
and that when they are stepping up to represent their communities and they're trying to express an unpopular opinion or a new opinion or even one that is only in opposition with a small vocal minority, the attack and the assault, whether it's physical, emotional, or, or psychological, is unrelenting and it goes far beyond the comment section of any particular media outlet. It is online, mm -hmm. it is in person, it is at your place of work, and it completely overshadows your life. And so I think that again, you have to look at the emotional labor that we are pushing onto these oppressed ethnicities as a dominant society and expecting them to not only deal with the trauma we've subjected them to, but we expect them to fix the systems that we created to impose the trauma on them. It's not reasonable. So mm -hmm. for Trent, I can see why he had to step aside. And I think that we need other voices, other people that are not Indigenous or not part of the BIPOC community to truly step up as allies and walk the talk. You, you don't get to just change your Facebook profile picture to an orange circle and then figure you've done your bit. There is a whole lot more work to be done and people need to step up and start doing it and speaking out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the um, once again, it's, it's either the irony or the sad part of it is just that, that Trent was the one on the board that was uh, probably fighting most hard or most, most strenuously uh, to, to further uh, Indigenous issues at the board level and throughout the district, uh, you know, and, and this board, you know, they were they were one of the first in the province to to acknowledge and, and accept the truth and conciliation report, and you know they were doing. I, I know Trent and the rest of the, some of the board, I guess, were working very hard to push some of these issues, and 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 I guess you, you talk about. Uh, uh, systemic issues, yeah, it is. It is hard to push back on these, and, and especially when you have a lot of uh, people in the system that don't want to change. I guess I, I, I don't know. I don't know the inner workings of the board, but I, I can just imagine. You know, you you have you have a lot of people that are, that are working in systems that work for them, mm -hmm. and it's hard to change those systems. That's regardless exactly of, regardless of, of why, you know, regardless of whether it's racism or it's just a stupid system. You know, I, I, when I was in the corporate world, that was I always joke is, you know, if I get the answer is of why are we doing something, it's because we've always done it. To me, that was a good reason why we shouldn't be doing it anymore. And and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. This is the way we do things. Well, is it good? Has anybody ever looked at whether that's the best way to do something? You know, and, and often the answer is no. It's just the way we've always done it. You're 100% so, yeah, right. It's, yeah, you know, it's, it's 100% very... true in all areas right now. And the change that's yeah. happening terrifies people. And this idea of all of our old systems suck and we need to change them, okay, but we don't have the new system built yet. So not only are we asking people to abandon systems that they have grown up within, we're also not certain yet what the new systems look like that are going to work better. And so we're asking people to leap into the unknown and work collaboratively together to come up with a new solution. And that's scary as hell for most people. So I get mm -hmm. the resistance. I understand the resistance, but it, it has to be overcome. And I, I think that yeah. some of the extreme backlash we're seeing right now all across the world is a resistance and a, a reaction to that fear. Um, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what will be different, the fear of losing control and power, mourning for a system that did work for large groups of people in the dominant society, guilt and uh, regret over what had happened and things that you can't change. All, you know, it was, it was Chief Fredericks, actually, who told me years ago when we were talking about exhibits um, and we were working through which stories we were going to tell about the Clayton's history. And he, he said that it's important to tell all of those stories. It's important to get so that everyone understands what happened and that we all are in the same position as we start to look to the future. And I think we're right at that moment right now where, generally speaking, the majority of Canadian culture understands what happened in residential schools, at least on an intellectual level. And we all know we need to do better and we need to make restitution and we need to try and, and help rectify the impacts and the damage that was done. We're not sure how yet. We're muddling through it together and it's two steps forward and three steps back. And, and I think that's what Trent and the rest of the school district are experiencing at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's difficult, and, and I hope we can do it because the, 
the up the, the the or the downside, and I've never supported this, is that the ministry comes in and simply appoints uh, uh, someone to run the district. Uh, you know, and and I I hate for that to happen because I I'm a staunch believer in democratic systems and 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 voting people in and letting them run things. And for the for the ministry to come in and, and appoint a, a trustee or whatever they would do, uh, you know that's in my mind the, the worst possible solution uh, because it needs to be, uh, you know, we need to have an elected board and they need to be in there to get this work done. So, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that in this instance simply because I think the work that needs to be done is highly specialized and it requires talent and a skill and a history and an empathy that you, just because you're elected doesn't necessarily mean that you possess you know the um like i wouldn't want to just elect a cpa like i i would want to hire a cpa who has all those qualifications but i wouldn't want to just elect joe q public and then put them in charge of all of the books of a major organization with no cpa experience um and I, I think that we're talking about something similar right here. This is even more complex because you're dealing with people's emotions, with entire administrative systems. We're talking even about an electoral system that perhaps is systemically racist. And so the idea that perhaps what needs to happen is government steps in and appoints an expert to steward all of these changes and gives them the power and the autonomy and the control that they need to be able to implement those changes. I don't think that we want to do away with an elected board and I wouldn't want someone to run it in perpetuity, but I feel like there needs to be some mechanism to provide the support for the elected people that don't have any of the necessary skills or experience in navigating this. There's very few people out there, quite frankly, that do because it's new to all of us. So I, I get what you're saying about democracy being really important and that we need to elect people to be our representatives. But in this one instance where we're talking about a school board that is identified as racist, that has clear examples of racism, that has now lost its two visible minority trustees to the same thing, systemic racism, I don't see that the skill set exists within the remaining board or in the senior staff to steward this because it's clearly not working so far. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the senior staff, and that's where the, that's where the other uh, shoe drops in, in any organization, uh, especially the school district, because um, school district staff uh, have have a considerable amount of power, and they can get things done in the school district. And, and I don't know that that's happened. And, and of course, this district, uh, there's been turnover of superintendents. The current superintendent is on a medical leave; has been for several months now. Um, so you have that problem at the at the top, uh, at the very very top, where where there's turnover. So so it, it, like you say, it is hard to to steward a lot of these changes when you get new people in. It takes them six months to get up to speed to figure out what the heck they're doing, and then uh, you know by then we're we're six months down further down the road of uh, of having all these uh, systems that don't work, uh, you know, continue to chug along and, and do their thing, and, and that's not that's not a good thing either. So. So yeah, it's it's a very difficult issue, and of course, there's the other one. It's always been my pet peeve with school districts is I sometimes don't wonder why we have elected school boards at all because they really, really don't have a lot of power. Um, you know, when they took away the right to tax for for local school boards to tax, the school boards became um, you know hamstrung. They're they're they are basically there as as uh, um, uh, to soften the blow for decisions that come out of Victoria uh, that affect locally, uh, we've seen that with school closures. Uh, it's, it's always on the on the heads of the local school board, but it's really Victoria that's pulling the pulling the strings and putting the board in a in a situation where they have no options. Well, then maybe and, the, most, the chair and the vice chair's resignations are bang on the money, and the school board is yeah. irrelevant, and it doesn't matter who you elect to it. The problems in Victoria. Yeah. And and if if there's any if there's any consolation, or depending on how you look at it, uh, the the advisors report that came out of the forty some recommend recommendations, there, there's a good dozen of them that were uh, provincial in nature. It was it was not about the local board. Uh, so that may be where where hopefully or, or local or school boards could be heading 
is is to is to uh, you know deal with some of these things and, and make systemic changes that address these issues. Because the other part of it is is that I suspect that that Prince George is is not alone in uh, oh, no. uh, in some of these problems. You know, I spent a lot of years in Williams Lake, and holy man, there was a lot of issues there too. And, and I suspect Williams Lake, the school district there, has has a lot of the similar problems. It's systemic. It is hard baked right into the whole organizational structure. And so if they aren't serious about fixing it, then I think they have no moral authority to lead because they've been told now very clearly by an external review, by people that are on the inside trying to make change, that there is no safe table within the school system to speak truth to power. You can certainly see it as to what's unfolded here in Prince George, whenever there's any discussion around a name change or a complaint, or even Chief Logan's uh, demand that Enbridge move their pipeline off of reserve land. You know, the, the, the immediate backlash is to blame the Indigenous community, and it's the most asinine response I have ever seen. And it's quite loud, and I think that things need to change. And a big piece of that is teaching kids right from the time they're in kindergarten. If our mm -hmm. school district's getting it this wrong, then it is no wonder that as adults, they are ill-equipped to deal with the kinds of critical thinking necessary for the sorts of massive change we're talking about in society right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's switch topics a little bit again as we, as we uh, wind, wind along, I'm not sure, as we wind go along. along. Wind along. along. Yeah, I don't think that's an expression, but we'll no. accept. <laughs> we'll make it one. Um, the election. Um, uh, are are you on the edge of your seat for the the election that uh, that nobody wanted, that that nobody cared about, that uh, that's not really going to change anything? Yeah, I. Uh, you'd think that I'd be right into this, watching it from the sidelines and armchair quarterbacking, and I'm really having trouble getting into it. And I know if I am. That's got to mean that most of the Canadian population is just not paying that much attention. I, uh, I think it's a mistake because it's a really important election. I don't love that we're in the middle of an election, and I think it was an error to call one. Although having watched the evolution of the campaigns, there are some very stark differences on the left and the right with how folks see us rebuilding after this pandemic. So maybe there is some truth to the argument that we needed to give Canadians an opportunity to weigh in because whether you're voting left side or right side, those are completely divergent approaches to how we rebuild this country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm a political junkie and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the all candidates forum was the other night and, and I went to the movies. I missed the All Candidates Forum the other night, and then I went to look at it, and I see that the recording failed, and so you can't even watch it now. Well, that, that was the tough part for me, because I thought, well, it'll be recorded. I can watch the recording later at my, at my leisure, and, and, and I got home and or checked, and there's there's nothing there. I, I managed to record uh, half of the uh, half of the second half, so, uh, you know, it, it did get some... Uh, but even that, you know, and and we see, we see some of these things, and, and I know you've talked about this before as being a candidate that 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 forum it was not a debate they build it as a debate uh, it was simply asking questions of candidates which is not a bad thing um, but uh, you know I, I would have liked to see more interaction between the candidates and certainly on I would think that on zoom as the moderator you can hit mute on anybody so you can control uh, when people start talking over each other uh, so yeah, I would I would have much preferred the, a different format, and it's too bad Todd isn't here because it would give him a hard time. Uh, yeah, I really uh, struggle with the the notion. Okay, this is going to sound partisan, and I don't know how to get around it, but I really do believe that in 2015 we had debates, we had crosstalk, yeah. we had the opportunity to challenge sure each other did. and to really debate things out, and there was no incumbent. Then we get into 2019. And all of a sudden, we're not allowed to have any crosstalk, not allowed to have any debate. All we're allowed to have are these kumbaya politics forums where we all answer questions and basically, for the most part, agree on everything. And nobody's any the wiser on the way out the door. And there's no opportunity to question the incumbent on his voting record. 
That, in my mind, in a situation where you have an incumbent, is the primary purpose of a public forum is to, as the conservative world likes to say, hold their feet to the fire when they're always wanting to mm -hmm. question Trudeau on his record, but they sure don't want to be questioned on their own. And the in 2019, the debates that were not being set up by the chambers, uh, the conservative candidates were not interested in participating in. And so the yeah. so-called debates that were set up by the chambers, all the conservative candidates would go to. And those debates were just forums. And so I feel very strongly that there is some sort of protective desire on the part of the chambers, which I have no proof of. This is an outside person looking in, but it feels wrong to me. And it certainly doesn't give the voters a clear opportunity to even understand what Todd and Bob's voting records have been in their service to their communities. Yeah, I, I would certainly like to form or debate that where the, you know, rather, rather than, uh, than uh, we, the media are getting public questions from the public, uh, certainly that, that has a, a place to play in it. But, but I agree with you, there should be a section in there where other candidates get to ask specific questions of other candidates. And, and yeah, the, in that format, the the incumbent is certainly going to get grilled because that's that's what you need. They're 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 running on their record. Well, you need to know what that record is and and why they did what they did. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. The last couple of elections, we just haven't seen that. Uh, you know, the the forums are are, are very anemic, and and uh, you know they don't they don't really give any information. That's it. Yeah, because I, I remember that forum and it was you and, and actually Trent Derrick who went after Todd there that uh, on that, uh, I can't remember what the question was, but geez, you, you guys were, you got him all flustered and uh, and uh, he couldn't answer the questions. And, uh, you know, and that was, and that was what the public needed to see. It didn't, it didn't change the result of the election, obviously, but, uh, you know, that's because when you're looking at forums, you want to be able to see who your candidate is, what they're what they're like, and what they're about, and how they how they react to things, and how you know uh, everybody can look good on a poster that's uh, that's been you know handled by some PR firm, but when it comes down to it, and, and asking questions and meeting with the public and and that kind of thing, I think the public need to know what each candidate what they're about, and that's that's how you find that out. That's that's just me. Yeah, well, yeah. look at this particular election and the bizarre discussion happening at the, the conservative national campaign around gun control and the repeal of what is it, C-51 that was brought in by the Liberals that increases background checks on gun control legislation on, on purchasing guns and then bans these so-called assault rifles. So now you have in the conservative platform we're still going to repeal all of this stuff. Oh, but we're going to keep the same weapons banned. Well, it's impossible. You can't have it both ways. And yet there's been no discussion of guns in any of this here in our area that I've seen at all. And yet in 15 and 19, we talked guns every single time we took a microphone. So Todd and Bob have not been put in the position of having to say, yes, this is true. We will retain these bans on these guns, which wouldn't fly well in these particular ridings. Or, no, we are going to repeal the legislation and get rid of all of these bans, which also wouldn't fly well with progressive voters across the country and in these particular ridings. So they're being allowed to have it both ways because no one is, again, to quote Mr. Doherty, holding their feet to the fire. The other one, I would say, is around abortion. And the fact that both Todd and Bob were endorsed in the last election by a, a very strong pro-life coalition that will not endorse a campaign or a candidate unless they are clearly pro-life. No other options. But again, no one's asking Mr. Doherty and Mr. Zimmer these questions. How did that actually happen? How can you possibly be on that list with these other conservative candidates and yet claim to be in favor of women's rights? But if no one's questioning these things, if no one's forcing them to answer those questions, voters can very easily go to the voting booth and vote for someone that their personal politics or their personal opinions are completely at odds because they have no idea what their opinions really are. They're crafted mm -hmm. and covered and hidden within this national campaign. Now I'm picking on Todd and Bob. I am certain the same is true in every other single party, because I would imagine that the Conservatives would like to be able to question um, Garth and Amir on the Liberal Party's record. 
but they haven't mm -hmm. been able to do that either. So, you know, I, I just feel like the forums, the way they're done, are not doing anyone any favors. Yeah, and that goes at the at the national level too. I watched the you know the the leaders debate there last week, and it, it was the same sort of thing. It it was it was uh, like I said, it was anemic. It, it, there were there are few sessions of uh, uh, you know uh, a little bit of back and forth, but but not a lot. And, and, the, and the big thing that came out of uh, out of that debate was that. Uh, how half the country, or at least Quebec, is offended by a question from the from Sachi Curl at Angus Reid, which was, in my view, a very legitimate and a very well phrased question. And now it's been turned into uh, this whole thing about uh, you know Quebec and and being insulted because uh, they have laws that are racist, and so people will say, well, why are you a racist uh, province? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's. It, yeah, it's you know, just it, goofy. It, it, it seems the wrong particular question to clutch your pearls over. Yeah, I, I think if yeah. you're going to have racist legislation, you're going to have to expect to be called racist. That's kind of how it works. They're connected. Yeah, yeah. but it, but it plays well in Quebec. So and, and that's the and that's the old knock. You know, like uh, <laughs> the old the old saying: a, a strong Quebec runs the country, and the only thing that can defeat that is a strong Ontario. So nothing else matters. And we see that in the election after election, where where uh, the leaders uh, that's where they spend all their time. This election, I don't know that that uh, I, I can't remember if Trudeau has been anywhere in the prairies. Um, I don't know actually. I don't think so. I haven't seen any particular coverage of that. It's possible, I guess, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't seen any any coverage. It, it was in Atlantic Canada today or yesterday, and I think it's probably the only time. And surprisingly, our tools the same thing and sing. It's the GTA, Quebec, and the Lower Mainland. That's where they go. There might well, be gonna... the foray into, foray into somewhere else, but that's pretty much where they go. So I would take that moment as a segue into one of my own particular soapboxes, which is if we continue to send conservatives to Ottawa from these ridings, we will continue to get ignored by all parties because yep. the conservatives don't think they can lose the other parties don't think they can win, so no one is prepared to deal with an issue in our riding that could impact their success in some other part of the country. So we have our MP, uh, in, I'm thinking particularly of Mr. Doherty, uh, being handed hyper-partisan scripts to read in the House of Commons, and then when it's his time to try and assist somebody who's looking for a grant or assistance within the government, He's going to meet with more resistance from the governing party of the Liberals because he's just finished saying all sorts of nasty things about them publicly in the House of Commons. But his mm -hmm. party has him do that work because they know it doesn't matter what he says in the House of Commons, he will continue to be elected in Prince George Caribou. So yeah. I really think that people need to recognize that if they're happy with the status quo in terms of how these areas are treated by Ottawa, regardless of which party's in power, you need to let them know that these ridings are in play because the Liberals will pay absolutely no attention to this riding because they don't think they can win it and so they will invest their time and money in other ridings and the Conservatives are in exactly the same boat and I would argue that so are the NDP. Yeah, absolutely. I, I said for a long time the best thing that we could do provincially and federally is, uh, is, is elect uh, one from one party, one from the other. Uh, At so least somebody a, different. Yeah, at least somebody different. So you're you're going to get uh, attention paid to you. It, it's right. The 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 party the writings are then in place. So then the parties do pay attention to them, and uh, and, and that's uh, you know and, and from and you can also look at that from a constituent standpoint. You know, it's like um, it's it's like you say. Uh, uh, Todd get, reads the hyper partisan uh, stuff in the House of Commons and then tries to get some work done at a committee level or constituent level and, and the door shuts on them. So, so I look at it from Prince George, well, it, you should be, we should be hedging our bets, elect a conservative and a liberal because uh, that way, whoever's in power, you can go to one MP that's in on the governing party, you know, like heaven forbid we, we, we elect a Maverick party MP uh, imagine how that MP is going to get anything done, uh, uh, even on a constituent level, uh, in Ottawa. They just don't, you know, the doors aren't open for you. 
whether it's hard, partisan or not, it, it, it's just, uh, it, you know, uh, you can look at a lot of, a lot of people as some people say we should elect more independents. So look at Jody Wilson-Raybould as, as a prime example, as, as did wonderful things in government and was a, was a power broker for sure, and got elected as an independent and uh, had time to write a book, uh, you know, so. I would argue, though, that these ridings haven't done any better having um, sitting MPs that are also in government. You know, Harper nope. was in charge for a very long time, and we had conservative MPs then, and we were ignored. Again, because oh, exactly. conservatives could do whatever they wanted here, knowing they'd still win, so they needed to invest all kinds of effort into the areas in Quebec and Ontario where they were trying to make gains. So yeah. no one has ever said to me, man, I love how Ottawa treats our area. Wow! It's the best how they listen to us and they provide us the appropriate funding and their decisions are being made with our best interests in mind. Not once has anyone ever said that to me, regardless of who the governing party is in Ottawa. And the consistent yeah. piece is that we have always had conservative men representing those two ridings. So yeah. I don't know, keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Tell me again what that's a definition of. That's a definition of a lot of places down the states where you have senators and stuff like that have been there for 40 years yeah. and, and are still and are still uh you know making decisions in this day and age and then they haven't they haven't matured so you know you run that risk of uh, not not to suggest that we need term limits but you run the risk of a lot of a lot of people that are, that just sit there and they feel it's their right to to be the elected representative and uh, and do whatever the heck they want and 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 there's no consequences they never lose so the fact is i think bob doherty is actually working hard i think he's doing his best i think he's yeah. doing what he can do to try and support this community and I, i'm not making these statements because i think todd's being lazy or todd's not doing what he can do for this area but i think the situation he is in is untenable and i think that the decisions are being made by parties that are far beyond anything and that he can do uh, so I, I really do believe that the if the community wants change and wants to be treated differently and wants to be heard, you're right. You need to start sending other people, other yeah. parties. Yeah. And, and of course, there's there's always there's always my, my pet uh, soapbox. If you, you mentioned yours, is that you know uh, proportional representation does a lot to 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 mitigate that because you have to you have to try to appeal to more than simply your base. Uh, Which version do you push, though? Like, to me, that ranked ballot is the most logical and simple, but that puts the Liberals in powers forever, and I don't think that's healthy either. Well, the one I, the one I actually like is, is the BCSDB system that we came up with 20 years ago or whatever it was, but, but it was complicated. And uh, you had to put your trust in elections BC or Election Canada or whatever to sort it out. Um, but <laughs> it, it, Given that they're at the diocese, I might have trouble with that. Yeah. So, so, but, you know, and, and I, and I, when that went on, I did a lot of things. I actually, uh, through the, through the paper, uh, held a, uh, an STV ballot in conjunction with the provincial election and, and got people to vote that way. And the, and the results were exactly the same, uh, surprisingly. STD um, is single transferable vote or something, right? It's not sexually transmitted disease. No, I hope I said STV and not STD. <laughs> That's why I thought we'd be specific. <laughs> But yeah, that 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 is the, you know I I support that and and mixed mixed member proportional representation is is probably the one most widely used around the world in places that have proportional vote, uh, you know and that that way you you still you get to vote for your candidate and you get to vote for your party, and uh, and um, you you that way and and it's ba and it balances out right so that. So that the the same number of MPs. So so you can still vote for your MP in your riding, and you vote for the party, and then the, it's balanced out from a slate of other candidates that yeah. are chosen. And, yes, and the knock against that is 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 the the other ones that are that are elected that get that get named in are not necessary are not elected specifically. That's one of the reasons why I like STV is that you have a slate of candidates. It's a large slate of candidates, and you get to vote. Um, for each uh, candidate, you, it, it is a ranked ballot system, same as same as the other one, but it, but it calculates the ranks differently, and and so um, in my mind, it, as a voter, I always want whatever gives me the opportunity to do more at the ballot box. I'm happy with, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, going in four years and marking an X once and then going away for four years is, is not to me an ideal system. Now, if I go in and, and I have to go through and I have to look at each candidate and decide each which one of those each ones I like and, and which order and the party, uh, you know, then, then I'm doing more when I'm going in the ballot box. And to me, that's a better, that's better. So I guess the problem is though, I mean, you're, you're a self-described political junkie and yeah. uh, how many people out there would do the kind of work that you're talking about, or would it simply chase more people away from that ballot box? I guess that's one of the worries. Well, that's the thing. It could it could be tougher, but but you know the, the thing is with with STV the way it was set up. If if you're a diehard liberal, you would go in and say in a riding like this, uh, you know the the two ridings here would would likely be combined. So you would have two liberals on your ballot. So you, if you're if you're a staunch liberal, you can still just vote for two liberals. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, done. I'm I, I may have been a candidate, but I'm not really all that partisan. And so I'm I'm voting in Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies right now, and I'm looking at that riding and I'm thinking strategically and I'm trying to decide where I think my vote can have the most impact on my interest in trying to get the uh, federal parties to pay more attention to our area. And so I'm looking far beyond uh, Amir, not that I have anything against Amir, the Liberal candidate, I just don't think that not being from the area is going to be yeah. all that helpful when it comes to trying to amass the vote. So I'm looking very closely at Corey and the NDP because I, I want to know more about where he's coming from as a, an individual. Because I, I think you have to vote for the person in front of you under this system or you're stuck with this, I don't know, you're, you're, people all think they're voting for Jagmeet or uh, Justin Trudeau or Aaron O'Toole and they're not. They're voting for the individual that will represent them in Ottawa. Yeah, that's one of the, the strange things about our system is that we 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 don't vote for the leaders, uh, and, and yet uh, yeah, the election campaign is all about the leaders. Yeah. So, but, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Anyways, we're surprisingly we're coming up on just about an hour, so uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. This is a good conversation today, man. We covered a lot of ground, and uh, it was a good uh, good chat. You bet. So uh, as Parting words? Well, I think no matter how you look at it, it's really, really important that you vote. And the early voting was extremely busy right across the country. And particularly here in Prince George, our ridings look like the, the early vote numbers are way up, which is really exciting for me. I hope that our day of election voting is just as much. I also will say just for those uh, folks that are Indigenous and that don't want to go to the diocese to vote, that the returning officer and the poll captains have said there is the opportunity to go to a different polling station and request an exception be made and that you have to do that it takes about an extra 20 minutes but you can do it and they will allow you to vote right on site and you would not have to set foot in the diocese so please do go to another voting station and ask for that exception if in fact you're uncomfortable with going to the diocese please don't just stay home and not vote you really really need to vote we need your voices and you know that we need to know that the indigenous community is voting in large numbers because that too will have an impact on policy and leadership whether the candidate you vote for wins or not the fact that you vote it will matter absolutely i would just echo with that make sure you go out and vote on uh on september 20th uh, doesn't uh, doesn't well it does matter who you vote for but uh what matters it does matter even more that you go out and vote so so please go out and vote and uh it's our it's our democratic system and uh and we have to use it so on that note we will see you again next week <laughs>